And um, this is um, what you call our science class. That's what I call it. That's not the real name of it, but uh, we're going to be dealing with that tonight. We're going to be dealing with um, uh, supernova, but that's actually a, a smaller, more specific term. So I want to just use this term, the death of suns. Now, of course, in physics, that would be S-U-N-S. -S. In Christ, that would be S-O-N-S. -S. Because um, out of all of the events that happen in the universe, the most powerful, the most uh, uh, incredible results, the one with the most incredible results, is the death of sons. And this is no exaggeration. It's, uh, certainly it's not an exaggeration in physics. There's not a physicist you could argue with that would say, no, there's, you know, unless they wanted to just say, okay, the Big Bang Theory itself or whatever, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but every one of them would point to the death of suns. Or, you know, another way of wording that for physics sake is the death of stars. But suns aren't stars, are they? <laughs> They're just suns in the image of Christ. And um, so uh, <clears throat> there is this reality in the natural, and we've learned from some of our early classes in this subject that we went to the scriptures and we saw that the heavens don't just declare um, physics. The heavens don't just declare um, moral reality. The heavens declare the glory of God. And I don't know how familiar you are with the scriptures, but in John 12, 24, or John 12, 23, Jesus says, now is the Son of Man glorified, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And so you find that the, the, the true hour of glory happens to be the same hour, what's it called? The hour and the power of darkness. That's what Jesus called it. The very same moment, literally the same moment in time, not counting, the same moment of reality is this highest glory to God. And is this, uh, how do you say it, the, the highest power of darkness, the highest glory. That doesn't even, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't compare it. You would say the highest power of God. But no, in Jesus' death, just like in a supernova or, some, or, in, or the death of any sun, there is a glory that is not of this earth. Let's face it, when men seek glory, they seek to be acknowledged, paraded, lauded, you know, considered something special. Am I right or wrong? You want to you get glory in this earth, you may have to cheat, lie, steal. You may have to do all sorts of things to get it, but you'll get your glory earthly glory. But in Christ, the highest was when he laid down all of those things for the Father's heart, for the Father's will. According to the nature that is God, in other words, just being himself, for, for what, for if, just consider this, if Jesus truly is the Lamb of God, if, he, if that is really who he is, not what he does, I mean, that that more perfectly describes his nature, not his title, but his nature. 
if that more perfectly describes him, then it would take way worse than anything that he faced when he walked this earth to truly show forth that nature. Can I get an amen? That he is a lamb. It would take something way worse than Pharisees saying bad things about him. You know, uh, I was reading even today when he died, the high priest in them spread a rumor with the soldiers that guarded the thing and said, he didn't, you know, he didn't rise from the dead. They came and stole his body away. And that's the rumor they spread at the resurrection. The glorious, the glorious day of resurrection is tainted with ugly filth about Jesus. And so Jesus, he knows who he is. What did he say also in John 12, 24? He said, now is my soul troubled. Okay, I don't know that you ever get to the point where your soul doesn't affect you or, or trouble you, not affect you. How about trouble? You see why I stopped it? Because it can trouble you and not affect you because you're guided by the life of Christ. You're guided by the Lamb of God. You see what I'm saying? But if you're looking for the day where you will be able to go through things and it won't, and things won't bother you or trouble you, it's probably not going to happen because Jesus, you can't get any more pure than Jesus. And Jesus said with his own mouth, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. And so the death of the son, the death of the son, supernova <laughs> had arrived and he knew his purpose he he was you know i love that i love the title but i love the book too a book by ellie maxwell called born crucified they've actually put it out several times since then they changed the name and i didn't like it but born crucified because jesus was born as a lamb therefore crucified but he was he knew why he was born. He knew his purpose. He knew why he was there. It wasn't to, you know, wasn't to change the world. Yes, the world would be changed. Yes, people would be affected. Yes, incredible things would happen, but not in his lifetime. <laughs> Only in his death time. Can I get an amen? And, and so for the lamb to truly show what that meant to people, it would require incredible drastic measures. It would require incredible darkness for the light because what does it say in Revelation? For the Lamb is the light of the city. It, that is the light. That, you know, we're looking for seeing light. Well, that's the seeing you're going to see. You're going to see the Lamb. It would take incredible darkness to show lamb light. Oh, what a contrast, because we're thinking to show Jesus light is to, um, you know, I, I forget where it was. I've been traveling so much, and I'll be gone this weekend again. I'm sorry for that, but just going. And uh, I was going somewhere. I guess it might have been Skip's funeral or something, and I was praying on the way there, and I said, Lord, just let, just let people see Jesus in me. And the Holy Spirit said, well, what if I don't want them to see Jesus in me? What if I want you to live Christ, whether they see it or not? I mean, I never thought of that before. I'm, I'm not spiritual enough to think of that on my own. And he was basically, he's just saying, can't you just be? Can't you just let Jesus be as your life and, and nobody see him and you not, you know, and you go, oh, I just want to. But see, part of that is flesh and part of that is, could be religion, part of it could be the Lord. And that is, well, I want people to see Jesus, but 
Okay, I'm just, I'm just thinking. I'm just running with this a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm watching all the people standing around the cross. I'm watching the soldiers shove the spear in his side. I'm watching them when they slapped him before they hung him up there. I'm watching all the stuff that they're doing. And my question to you is, did they see Jesus? And the answer is, yeah, they really, they really did. They didn't understand Jesus, but they saw Jesus. And therein is the problem. Maybe we should pray a different prayer. Lord, may they not just see Jesus in me and you. May they understand not Jesus in me, but Jesus and therefore Jesus in you. That would explain you. That's your identity. That's your definition, Christ. But Christ who? And that's part of, you know, I don't know how far we'll, we'll get in this, this first class, but that's this reality that... Um, uh, that the true seeing of Jesus is to see the Lamb of God. The true seeing of the Lamb is to see incredible love. Love. Because it was love that was hung on that tree. It was. It was love. It wasn't stupidity. <laughs> I'm not thinking of Jesus now as much as us when we lay down our life. It's not stupidity. It's not blind um, allegiance. It's not pressure, peer pressure. It is, if it, if it does it in true spirit, it is love. It is the definition of love. Love honors not itself. Love speaks not of its own. Love does not, you know, right? It is the true beauty of God who is love as expressed in Lamb who was Jesus. Yeah. So, we're, we're going to study a tough scripture here in John. It's, a, the ver it's the 16th verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. All right, so this is, this is not just the preparation for Jesus, the first supernova. This is, if you want to call it that, this is the Big Bang, really. <laughs> this is the one that brings everything into existence. This is beyond sons dying. This is the son bringing all into existence through what? Through death. <clears throat> and so, uh, but it is, but, but if you'll notice very specifically that he, he so loved that he gave his only son. Now, come on. If you're going to love somebody, you might give them, I mean, if, if you loved your uh, 68 Camaro, it would really be love for you to give that to somebody else. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and this, this sort of starts testing our love because, like, if you had a Taylor guitar and you knew somebody wanted it. <laughs> well, then, true, never mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying. <coughs> and that is, but, but, here's the, but, but all of that is fluff. None of that counts. Here's what counts. God gave his son. His son. He, and, and listen carefully, he gave a son. He gave a son. He gave a son. He didn't give an angel. He didn't give a good man. He didn't give a, uh, uh, a, one of the top righteous men. In the world, he none of those measured up in his heart to the son, and he gave that son in death. He did that. Now, as we'll see through the scriptures, we'll go through a few scriptures. He didn't just do that for the fun of it. 
He didn't just do that because he, he just simply wants to save people. If you went by this scripture, that's what you would believe. But guess what? You ought to keep reading the Gospel of John. It gets better. There's more to it than just that. Yes, that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, somebody, uh, we were talking the other day, in fact, several times, I, I think here in Texas, and then when I was up in uh, uh, Iowa recently, it was 105. I went, what is this? I've traveled, you know, certainly hundreds of miles north. And what? Uh, the hottest we'd had up to that point was 107. I said, I, I get two degrees out of this? Is that all I'm going <laughs> to get? But, you know, both places, we talked about this. Somebody said, oh, God, it's so hot, you know. And I said to, I said to someone, I said, you know, hell is a double Texas. <laughs> it is not just Texas. It is double whatever you've got here and probably way more than that. But, you know, uh, sometimes we forget the simplest things, like thankfulness that we're not going to go to hell. Is that the gospel? No, that's the benefit. But thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, thank God I'm going to go to heaven. Is that the gospel? No, that's the benefit of the gospel. But, oh, darn it, thank you, Jesus. You know, on and on and on. The realities of what we have in Christ, the realities of what we have by death, burial, and resurrection, the, the realities that we have by union and the benefits of those realities are, are true and real and valuable. So John 3.16 is, is true and it has its place, but God didn't just give his son to save yucky people so that yucky people could continue throughout all eternity. <laughs> oh, I think I'll populate heaven with yucky people that are saved. That'll be, that'll be fun, huh? Holy Spirit. You know, Michael the angel of war is putting on more munitions not for hell, but for heaven, for what he's going to have to deal with, with all these people running around pulling all this stuff. No, no, and no. The father gave his son so he could get more sons. Sons, not Christians, not believers, not good guys, not more sons. And so... Um, you, you, but you do see the gospel there. The son is being given. This is what sons do. Anybody catch that out of John 3.16? This is what sons to, do. They give themselves to the father's plan so that others may come in. If that is the means, then there needs to be some giving. There needs to be less taking. There needs to be more death so that more sons can come into existence. And we'll, we'll cover that in the physics side, but, but trust me, that's where more sons come from, is the death of a son. All right. So, well, just to, you know, look over in Hebrews with me, Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll just, we'll cover these things with scriptures. Uh, however, the problem with that is it's going to stop me from getting too deep into the physics side, but, but Hebrews 2 and verse 10. Speaking of Jesus, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now, if you're wondering uh, what that suffering is, it's in the last part of verse 14. It says... That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And so, so this one for whom is everything, it's for him. Now we think it's for us, don't we? 
Well, it's for me because I'm faithful. It's for me because I'm, I'm committed. It's for me because I'm, you know, I, 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 you know, done things for God or I've stayed involved. I tithe. I, no, for whom or how many things? All things. Uh, and by whom are all things? So this sounds like it's going to be really good when it's saying this. For whom and by whom are all things to bring many sons unto glory. And then we find out that it's talking about this one. Oh, let me see if I can say it right. This one who deserves better. <laughs> who deserves better. I mean, how many of us have not in some situation said this is not fair? That is not right the way they're treating me. I deserve better considering how much I've done or what I've this and that and that, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, I, you know, I'm sorry, but in the language of heaven, it is just blah, 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 because God doesn't understand that kind of yakking. He doesn't understand that gibberish, you know. Well, it's not fair. It should be, you know, they should be, I, sh I you know, well, you know, the father would say to his son, now he wouldn't say it to any Christian. He wouldn't say it to just any Christian. He wouldn't say it to just any believer. But if you're a son and he considers you a son, then he considers that it's Christ in you. If you consider it's Christ in you, he may deal with you as sons. Wow. So he's going to talk a little more straightforward. He's going to talk daddy talk with you. He's not going to talk neighbor talk. Howdy, neighbor. That's how we do it in Texas. Howdy. We're polite and cordial. But he's going to say, son, we don't talk that language. That's not who we are. It's not just what we do. That's not who we are. We don't get caught up. In, and, and he would say, now, did you do what you did by the nature I gave you? Meaning, did you do all those things for them before this thing happened and they turned on you? Did you do it by my nature? You have to, you have to go through, you know, click, 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 computer, click, click, click. Yes. <laughs> okay, you got one right. <laughs> you know? Okay. And did you do it expecting while you were doing it to get something in return from them? No, I'm not, not when I was doing it. Really, I was just going with you. You know, I'm just, I'm just going with Jesus, you know. But maybe in the back of our mind, going with Jesus, we think it's going to be rewarded. And we have an idea of what that reward is going to be. People are going to respect us more. I think Paul was way more respected as a Pharisee than he was after he started preaching Christ, don't you? Stone. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and so, you know, but we, you know, that's, if we hear that, somehow we put rose-colored glasses on and we say, oh, but it's going to be glorious. No, it's, it's going to be ugly. It, it is. It's going to be ugly. What then in, you know, someone could say this, looking at that, say, what then is beautiful in this, say, what is of God in this whole situation? You are. You are in your spirit. You are in your spirit what? You are in your spirit a son that came to die to bring forth more sons. Think it not strange concerning the fiery deed. Do you think a, 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 a son going supernova isn't sort of a fiery trial? <laughs> you know, I mean, incredible heat and energy is released. And we'll get into that. But really, if you, if you define the, a star going supernova, a sun going supernova, if you defined it by the Father... He would say, instead of it, instead of a term supernova, or instead of it, he even saying the death of a son, he would say, this event 
is the release of incredible energy like you've never seen before when you lived. That's why there's son here. A son that lives, but in death, he's not, he's just saying, this, there is way more release of energy through this process. We go, death. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's, you know, because that's how we view it. He doesn't. He, re he views it as a release of energy and a release of materials by which other sons will be formed. Now, if you really held that in your mind, I mean, if you really, really believe that and you held that in your mind, don't you think you'd be a little more peaceful going through things? Well, I think we would, yes. Well, I think we do. I think we do. And yet, and yet, honestly, I mean, you know, I am not one for promoting glamour, rose-colored glasses, or whatever. I think that, I think that every every one that will be a son of God has to count this cost. But you can only count it so much because there is no way that you know for sure what all this is going to entail. But, but, uh, but if you if you ask me, what is glamorous or beautiful or or wonderful? is when you are no longer an outsider trying to be like a son and fretting over loss or, or giving, but you are a son by Christ and you love the ones who are literally hanging you on the cross and you're praying for them. Father, don't hold this against them. They don't know what they're doing. Do you think they know? I mean, in light of the eternal plan of God, do you think they know what they're doing? And the answer would be, <laughs> no. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But they don't know. They just don't know. And because they don't know, man, die for them. How else? How, you know, well, I'll pray for you, but I won't die for you. I mean, that's what a lot of people do. And you know what? If you're not going to die for them, pray for them. Jesus said to do that. He said, pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for, you know, pray for them. But, I, but, but if you're not, if you're a believer or a Christian, but you're not yet a son by Christ, this stuff is hard. No, it's impossible. Because as we said recently, maybe I, I don't know if I guess I wasn't preaching here. I don't know. Maybe I was. I'm confused because I've been so many places. Uh, the disciples said, how can, any, how can anybody be saved if what you just said is right? And he said, well, you know, with man, it's impossible. And then he says, but with God, all things are possible. Okay. I can always tell when it's me <laughs> because there's resistance uh, and when I say resistance I'm making a difference between my soul being troubled and resistance my soul can be troubled but I you know you know it's like a whiny kid I'm sorry till you stop whining we're not going to do anything with in your direction you know what I'm talking about We, you know, we got to get back in order here. God, Jesus, man, woman, family, straight on down so that it's Christ. It's the life that is the nature of God straight through all of us, you know. 
well, then it's, then it's not impossible. But man, you know, and no wonder people say, you know, they require this and that and that. Well, you know, I guess they never heard me preach. Not even once. I mean, think about it. It's, this is really all I ever say. It has to be Christ. It can't be us. If it's not Christ, we'll hate it. We will hate it. We will be frustrated. We will be resistant. Of course we will. And I don't even blame anybody for that. Because when it wasn't Christ in me, I was that way. I know what it's like to go, okay, I'll do this. And you commit yourself to something and then you hate the fact that you did it because it's requiring something that you really, it's not in your heart to give. But don't blame me if you committed yourself, you know, the three years in the Bible school. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, stop, stop committing. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, really, that's the way I say Just stop committing. Just float or leave or something. You know what I'm saying? Yes. You know, that's hard if you're in this for yourself. Because what if they don't see it? And then, and, and here, trust me, God will see to it nobody sees you doing that. <laughs> Just to check you out. You'll go, well, then what did I do that for? <laughs> you know, for his glory, maybe? <laughs> anyway, but I, I was just thinking about that scripture in, uh, in John 1 where he says, to as many as, what? Received, I always get this mixed up. Did I do it right, Mallory? To as many as received him. Now, you know, we almost have to put a question mark beside him. To as many as receive him, to them, the receivers of him, gave he power to become something, the sons of God, okay? Is that, is that pretty good? Is that good? Anybody think that's a good scripture? Because if you receive him, you don't know yet what you've received, but you have received the power or the ability or the authority and right to move on in to becoming a son of God by Christ, by the life of Christ, not just your that by attaining something. By Christ being revealed. And, and, then, and so then you get uh, 1 John 3, verse 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that he, we should be called the sons of God. Well, that's not the end of that verse. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. It doth not yet appear... Manifest, it's not manifest fully what we are, but we know that when he shall appear, we'll be like him. What is, what is the subject? Come on, give me the subject. Sons. Am I right or wrong? Sons, and, the, and he's, now he's not talking about Jesus, he's talking about you being a son, but that sonship happens when he appears, he, the, the son, as many as received him, they got the power to become something that they didn't or that they're not fully at receiving Christ. Okay? 
And so there's, there is this, this process in the mind of the Father. Well, you know, we've quoted it several times, but uh, look over in John 12, 24 again. Actually, we've quoted a bunch out of it already without even turning it there. Uh, but <clears throat> verse uh, 24 Verily, verily, I say, this is John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Okay. All right. If this was talking about a son, then he's talking about that son going supernova. He is. If, if he's talking about seeds. But if he were talking about a son, S U N, he would be talking because it's the same thing. He would be talking about the death of that son for the material to be released for other sons to be formed. Okay, you see that? Interesting how it's talking about seeds and fruit, though, because he says, but if that fall into the ground and die, it'll bring forth much fruit. All right, we think that he's the dying dude and we're the fruit catchers. I mean, really, that's sort of, he's the dying dude. John 12, 24, read it. He's the dying dude. Where the fruit? Well, maybe you should read like verse 25 and 26 and 27, 29. There you go. Um, 25 says, he that loveth his life. Dude, this is back on us. Get away. Let's talk about Jesus only dying, not me. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall you be all my servant be. If any man shall serve me, him will my father honor. Okay. If any man serve me, let him follow me. What is the picture we get? Well, the picture we get is Jesus walking along the road and Nazareth or Galilee somewhere and he's got sandals on and he's got a beard and everything and we're going, you know, I'm serving you so I'm going to follow you. So here we are and we're clomping along with Jesus so that when people go, hey, look, there's Jesus and there's his, his buds, you know, there's his, his uh, peeps, you know, whatever. <laughs> that's, his, yeah, that's his gang, that's his crew. That's usually what we think. This is clearly not talking about that. This is talking about Jesus going into death, and if anyone serves him, follow me into death. If I'm, I'm going to be a dying son, if I'm going to go supernova, you need to go supernova. And you tell me if that's not the context there. Am I making that up? No, I'm not. I know I'm not because that's not my doctrine. I had to change my doctrine for this. I had to. You think it's mine because this is all you hear me preach. You think it's mine because I raised up a school. You think it's mine because I raised up a church. You think it's mine because I've written a hundred books about the subject or preached a thousand sermons. It ain't my doctrine. Jesus said the same thing. It's not my doctrine. It's my father's. Because he came to be like us where he would give up everything so that the father would be everything. We do that so that Christ, the son, will be everything. It's not my doctrine. It is not. I didn't even like it at first. I was, I, I didn't, I was like Paul or Saul. I was like Saul. I resisted it. I stood up in church and rebuked the people that preached it over and over again. And those blessed people never confronted me. Not one time, never. You know what happened? I would leave that service, go to my bunk in the dorm of the Bible school I was at, open my Bible and the Spirit of God would show me that the very things I said are contrary to Him. And I went, you know, but see, at that time I didn't know anything about principles. I lived in events. Do you understand? An event is just something that happens you forget and then you go on and if you bump into the same thing in a slightly different guise, you, you have to learn it all over again. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, well, you just, you know, so you just like, you're like in a pinball machine. You don't know what's happening, you know, and you can hit, you can hit the same pole in that pinball thing a hundred times, and to you, it's just a, it's a new event, you know, what, what is this, you know? So, obviously, God had a lot to deal with in me, and I, and I'm not ashamed of the fact that it wasn't my doctrine. 
I, in fact, it was the doctrine I stood against until God made it my doctrine by revealing his son, not just to me, but in me. And with the nature, you go, yeah, this is right. Without the nature, you go, I don't know. You know, I could see the difference between me and him. I could see the difference in attitudes and everything. As long as it was me, I, I'll stand up and rebuke everybody, and I'll think I'm right, and I, I know better than everybody else, you know, and I'm resisting everything, and, you know, nothing really, I mean, I am the final say. Nobody, there's no body above me going to be able to correct me except my father. He didn't correct me. He revealed his son in me. And that is the correction because that's the nature that understands these things and can live them. I can't. You can't. And it's foolish to think that we can. When Jesus said, if any man serve me, let him follow me, do you know who he's talking to? <laughs> you got to love this. Out of room. You know, I'm using the chalkboard a lot more lately. Have you ever noticed that? When I get this handy. Okay, here is the ground, and here is the seed that fell into the ground, and here it is dying. And as life comes out of death, as it begins to grow, and as it begins to come, then, uh, for now, I'll just draw fruit in a circle. Then this fruit begins to come forth. And Jesus looks, because in his mind, he's not just looking at little followers that are following him around Galilee. He lives in a completely different realm. He lives in the realm of of the reality of death, burial, and resurrection because that's his life, that's his way. He, he doesn't get caught up in things and, you know, all of this. He, he lives according to a nature that, is, that leans this way. So, so he says what he's going to do, and then he turns around, and he's not talking to disciples, fall, uh, just people that are, you know, if you, if you want to say he's talking to followers and people that are following him around, when he, when he says the word, if any man serve me, that's who he's talking to. But then he says, if any man serve me, now he's talking to the fruit that he said will come forth when he dies. Follow me. Because you can, you can serve him, but you can't truly follow him without that nature. Does that make sense? You can't. It must be Christ. But we can talk about that all day long, but folks, I don't know. You know, I'm amazed at how many people don't get this. It's, I'm going to draw something on the board, even though it'll be messed up by something else. But this is really what it's all about. Get ready. It's going to be, it's going to be mind-blowing. It's the cross. It's the cross. It's not about Bible schools. It's not about raising up ministries. It's not about writing books. It's not about preaching. It's not about reaching the world with stuff that doesn't change them, and they're still as selfish as they, as they always were, except now they act better, you know, publicly. You know, publicly. Uh, let, me, let me ask you something. Can... Can any of you see what I just drew on the board? Can, can you? Can you all see that? It's about the cross. It's about death and therefore what comes as a result of it. But you, again, I've said this, you know, several times in my life. There can be no resurrection unless there's first a death. Resurrection does not exist outside of death. Don't shoot for, you know, somebody says, why do you preach death all the time? I said, well, when you die, I'll stop preaching it. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know when we're ready to lay down our life, the fruit will start coming. I don't have to preach fruit. I don't have to preach the stuff that had come forth from that thing. That's an automatic of a seed dying. You say, well, why, you know, 
Why do you preach death all the time? I, first of all, I'm not preaching death. I'm te preaching Jesus. I am. I'm not preaching death. I'm preaching Jesus. And it happens to be his nature, for God so loved that he gave his son. There it is. That, that uh, This is what sons do. Do, do, do. <laughs> you know? I mean, so, I mean, I, can, I think I would hear that a couple of times and go, you know what? I think this is all about the cross. I mean, I think that, so that when I ran into something that I didn't understand or whatever, I go, you know, I bet you this is about the cross. I mean, I got a feeling that the real issue here might be the cross. I'm going to do you a favor, too. I'm going to ride in the middle of it, cross. It's about the cross. It is about Christ. It is about the lamb. Because why? Why do we say the lamb? Because in that name you get both cross and Christ. You get it both. You don't have to say it's about the cross, it's about Christ. You say, lamb. <laughs> you know, it's the dumbing of society where we're, you know, just lamb. Yes. You know, and I won't be around forever. I mean, you know, this funeral reminded me recently. I, it, there's always this um, line, and you got to remember, I wasn't a first generation, and there were others who w came before me in this message. I, I, I'm not. Um, Skip was almost exactly 20 years older than me. And he just passed away. Wyman Pilot was 10 years older than me and 10 years younger than Skip. I am the next one 10 years away from that. And when I was 20, in my early 20s, I somehow saw that, that Skip was here and Wyman was here and I was here. And so we've been passing through a lot of years now. I mean, it's been a lot of years, doggone it. I mean, a lot of you, and, and, and that line has moved on and moved on until now Skip has passed away. And if Wyman lives to be 80 something, I mean, yeah, that's a good age. I mean, the Bible says, and if by reason of strength, 80 years, well, then he's got 10 years. And if, you know, if I don't go by the genes of my family, because if I do, I got, I got 10 years. But if I don't, and the, some reason the Lord wants me here longer, hey, I got 20 years. 20 years ain't long, folks. You'd be surprised how quickly that can go and how, like a vapor, I'll be gone. It couldn't possibly be about me. It couldn't possibly be about me. It couldn't possibly be about this place. This place is a place to learn what's eternal. This place is, and that you get it, that you carry that, that you become a son of God, that, that when, when it pleased God, he reveals what in you? His son. You were already saved. The revelation of Christ doesn't come to sinners. It comes to those who are already in the family. Where do I get that from? Galatians 4. And because you are children, he says, you know, uh, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child or immature, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. And then he describes the revealing of the son into a family member. The revelation of Christ 
or shall I say it like this, the making of sons that will populate the universe with more of Christ comes by the revelation of Christ. But the revelation of Christ is not deep knowledge. It's not understanding all mysteries. It's not, it's not being somebody, that, a great speaker that everybody follows and stuff like that. And maybe there are some like that. But my understanding of what a son is, is that he's born to die so that other sons will come after him. Just like a corn of wheat will die so that other seeds will come after him. It is not about glory. It is about the exact opposite of glory. The cross was not a beautiful thing. It was a horrible, ugly thing. And it would have been even horrible or more horrible and more ugly if you had been the one it was happening to. <laughs> Can I get amen? You know? Well, guess what? If, you, if God reveals his son in you, that's where you're heading. Because he says that the whole universe, the whole world is groaning, waiting for what? Jesus to come back in the air. That's not what it says. Waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Waiting, groaning, not happy. Not what it's supposed to be waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And we'll get into this, but there's, you know, there's, uh, there's two main things about a, a, a star or a sun that dies. Um, there is, uh, th their fruitfulness, I'm going to call it fruitfulness, their fruitfulness is based on the depth of their death, and I'm talking physics right now, but I'm also talking Jesus. But again, the heavens declare the glory of God. So it should be saying the same thing. It is the, the amount of fruit or the amount of effect that it has depends on the degree in which they die. Because there are differences or neutron stars and magnetars and pulsars and on and on and on and they're all they're all dying suns. They don't all have the same effect. They don't all have the same effect. There is one which we'll deal with in its separate thing where it produces what we usually think of as negative it produces one of the most glorious realities ever. It's called a black hole. But it's going to take a, a big, 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 big death to bring about, you know, we think the black hole would probably be hell. No. <laughs> um, and so it, de it depends on the size of the death. And usually that there are so many, most of the stars that die out is a smaller death, and therefore they have a smaller manifestation, okay? Because most sons, when they get into that, you, God gives you free will, and they die for a little while, and they go through a little bit, and then they pull out. Well, this is enough. Look, I can see some, you know, some good stuff happening. Well, what if it's not? What if, what if that's all that you ever saw and brought forth was the little bit that you saw happening? Doesn't Jesus deserve way, way greater than that in the earth, much less in this place or anywhere? You know, just more glory, but needs to be more death. Okay? And then the other factor is the size of the sun. A sun the size of our sun here in our solar system, it can't, it can't go supernova. It couldn't form a black hole. It can't, it, it, you know. <laughs> I doubt that it could form a magnetar. In fact, I'm almost positive it couldn't. A pulsar, it's probably just go red dwarf and that'd be it. But we think, you know, the knowledge of the sun we have, oh, it's, it's the biggest ever. 
Mm, no. No. It takes a really big son, meaning it takes someone in whom Christ is so formed that they won't pull out of the death, that they will embrace the death, that will say, bring it, bring it, bring it, because, the, you know, that son is not going to see the result. go supernova bye bye to that son in that form it's not going to see it well what is he going to see all he's going to see is the cataclysm that must be brought about for it to die well if it is a big enough son and if it goes through a big enough death and we'll go through this one of our classes maybe you know, soon you will see the gradual effect as these sons, and they're all sons that are dying. But I'll explain all that as we get into it. All right, so Romans 8, 29 says what? Okay, Jesus, uh, John three sixteen says, Jesus is the son, he must die. Romans 8, 29 says, you must be conformed to the image of his son, that that is the eternal plan of God, that you too become his son. And when it says you become a son, there's only one purpose for that son. And that is to bring forth more sons. That means it's going to have to go through a similar process. And, um, and I'll, I'm getting signed, so it's time to quit. Um, It gets real basic. It gets real practical down here on this earth. Philippians talks about this, and it says um, that, that God longs for us to be sons of God in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation, a crooked generation. You know, not just Christians, not just Christians, not just Christians, and not just believers, but sons. And that it is when he ordered the universe before one human being had the opportunity to ever become a son, when he formed it, he formed it out of dying sons. It's just incredible. That's how he formed it. Every ounce of matter and material that is this came. Anything that is came out of that. Your body, everything else, you know. And, you know, the iron in your blood. You know, if there's a magnetar just right out there, it'd literally pull the iron out of your blood. And we go, oh, it would erase all my data off my credit card. It would rip, it would pull the iron right out of your blood. <laughs> God wants this reality practical. He wants actual sons, not spiritual talky-talky sons. And the only way those sons are truly going to shine in his mind is in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in the midst of incredible darkness and how it is reacting to the light. Ah, I kill it. Ah. So, what am I saying? Cross. Cross. <laughs> All right. Um, oh, Mallory's going to have some announcements. Um, I wonder if Matt, if the if uh, when Ma after Mallory does her announcements, could you see if you can grab Chris and Kim and you too, and me meet with all the Healy clan, the new clan. I guess you're a clan. <laughs> and I'll be in my office, so it'll probably be right after this. In fact, we we won't have the second class. I need to have this meeting, so yes. Okay, Mallory, you come to yours, and then don't forget hers, and 